Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Lanny Ashlock. He's going to give a kind of update on what the promotion board research projects have been and uh, a couple of new projects that uh, were pretty interesting that's in the state. So, Dr. Ashlock. Well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be speaking to you today at the, the Soybean Research Conference. We started these several years ago, and uh, uh, I really think that uh, they certainly serve a, a very useful purpose and uh, appreciate your attendance, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. Uh, my topic today, and I'll try to stay on time, somehow over the years I got this reputation, very undeserved, that I have a tendency to go a little long at times, so I'm going to try to uh, do better on that. Uh, it, I came to work with the university, back with the university and the Soybean Promotion Board about 14, 15 months ago. And I knew that things had just kept growing and uh, projects had expanded, but I didn't really comprehend the, the scope of the program now. And uh, just looking at it as I got trying to get prepared for this little presentation this morning, got 30, uh, the board is looking at 35 research projects uh, that are designed to really increase yield, and not just increase yields, but protect yields. And uh, when you look at uh, controlling some of the pests, some of the problems, uh, as well as increasing yields, uh, and as, as Todd mentioned earlier, that is, that is certainly a major importance. And that's, that's really what, we're, uh, what a lot of their work is, and a lot of the money that he referred to is going in that direction here. And uh, Todd mentioned the uh, I think, of, and most of y'all are aware of the 100 bushel per acre yield challenge that's been ongoing. It's uh, funded by the Promotion Board and administered again through the Soybean Association uh, for this 100 bushel per acre. And we hadn't broke that yet. We've been at it, I guess, five years or so now. But getting closer, and I'll share a little bit of that with you in just a little bit, but uh, uh, that's really got a lot of attention, and some of y'all are, are, have participated uh, and really made an effort to, to uh, accomplish that goal of 100 bushels per acre, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, one of the projects that uh, I wanted to talk about that Todd referred to is this, uh, in 2011, uh, the, the, we initiated this soybean maximum yield project, and uh, actually Dr. Larry Purcell will be on the program uh, in just a little bit, but Larry and his uh, graduate student, Ryan Von Reckles, that, did I say that anywhere close, Larry? Ran Ruckel, okay, uh, have been uh, working on that really, uh, Larry has for two or three years working with Mr. Kip Cullard. And uh, Ryan came to, uh, as one of his graduate students, that came uh, to be with him this past year. And Nathan Slayton, who's also on the program today, is also an investigator, and they let me tag along this year a little bit as well. So I appreciated uh, that opportunity. But uh, part of their effort, and Larry's going to go into this detail, is actually going up to Mr. Culler's record uh, breaking yields. And I think everybody in this room has heard about these yields. Uh, up to uh, 2010, I think over 160 bushels per acre. But uh, Larry's been doing uh, uh, detailed observations and even some research up there uh, with Mr. Culler's. And uh, I'll share just a little bit of the information that uh, Larry uh, provided me. Uh, this year where they went in there and samples, replicated samples from several areas in the fields. The yields range from 79 to 106 bushels per acre. So those were down quite a bit from some of his other yields, but uh, we had quite a, quite a challenging year, which I don't have to tell anybody in this room. If you survived it, you did good. And, uh, but uh, that's still very good yields, but that's uh, at least the estimated yields that uh, uh, Larry and Ryan obtained from just sampling in, this, in some of his fields up there. And one of the things that with these observations that Larry's been involved in, and he's going to give a little bit more detail, so I won't go into that, but he's looking at all the different components, trying to really analyze them, of what uh, Kip is doing on his farm that results in these yields. So he's breaking this out, looking at the seed treatment part of it as replicated studies, varieties, and, and so on and so forth. So it's uh, very interesting. He's doing a lot of that work in Arkansas, either at Fayetteville or, or, or downstate. So he had some plots down here as well. And some of the things he's looking at are listed up there on the screen. Hope you can see that. But uh, 
Uh, irrigation courses is, is a large part of it, fertility, and a lot of the, looking at some of the pest management strategies, these variety selections, so on. But some of the work that Larry and Ryan did this year at Fayetteville and maybe some of the other locations, and he can clarify that he can defend himself when he gets up here. But they had yields that were in the range of 73 to 91 bushels per acre. So uh, as we're looking at trying to obtain these higher yields, uh, certainly uh, we hadn't broke that 100 yet, but uh, we're, we're getting close uh, in some of the research work. And I'll share with you in, in just a little bit what some of the growers are doing. But uh, one of the challenges that the board uh, kind of placed to, uh, to us is, let's see what you can do on the experiment stations. Uh, on soils that you know, reflect uh, many, of the, many of the fields that you farm, those of you in this room. So we worked down at Roar on a peri clay, at uh, Pine Tree on the silt loam soil there, more of the rice soil, and, and uh, at, on the alluvial silt loam soil at the Lawn Man Cotton Research Station with Mr. Claude Kennedy. So they cooperated very well with us, did everything we asked, couldn't have had better cooperation. And uh, there we kind of compared it with the Extension Soybean Research Verification Program approach. I uh, hope I didn't uh, do that a disservice, but we used that kind of as the standard. And then we tried some what we thought were enhanced management strategies after visiting with Larry and, and Nathan about some of the things that KIPP was doing in some of their research work. So that we established rather large size blocks, at some of them up to about 10 acre blocks. We're not replicated but they were in most cases side by side and just trying to see what we could do as far as yields go. Had a lot of help from, uh, uh, the, uh, well, I think Gus Lorenz is in the room, Dr. Lorenz, yeah. Uh, they scouted our fields for insects, make sure that wasn't gonna be a yield limiting factor. Uh, and well, I'll just get into some of those. These are some of the things that we actually did uh, in, in these plots. Uh, we put the standard soil test recommendation, uh, whatever it called for, and then on the enhanced or the intensified uh, area, we put out four tons per acre of chicken litter. And uh, we, we tried to pick very high yielding uh, private varieties, and we also uh, wanted to compare it with the new indeterminate 4 9 variety that uh, Dr. Chen and the university released, UA 4910. Put on the seed treatments, uh, standard was Cruiser Max, but we also put on Optimize and BioForge uh, force uh, in addition to Cruiser Max on the enhanced blocks. So you can see the differences, I hope that we did. And we upped the plant population just a little bit. We're plant, we were hoping to plant in April, and so we were shooting for about 165,000 anyway, and we, on the enhanced, we went on up to 180,000. Uh, Mr. Cullors uh, has a pretty high plant population. Fungicides, we just went to a program approach, put it out at R3 when we're just beginning to stick the pods, uh, little pods there, the blooms. And then we also did it on the enhanced, we went again at R5. And uh, we lowered the soil water deficit on the enhanced portion a half, a, a half an inch. So we're triggering irrigation even earlier on that. And of course, with the dry year that we had this year, we had really no complications. They were set up where they could irrigate very, down the road very well. So it took many irrigations, sometimes 10, 11 irrigations to accomplish uh, what we were trying to do. So I don't think water was a limiting factor. Just a little shot at some of the fields. Uh, we did try to let people know that their checkoff monies were being used in this project and uh, we had uh, great support from, the, from, as I said, from the university people. That's planting at, uh, at the Cotton Research Station there at Mariana on May the 7th. That was our earliest planting date, and that's a month later than I wanted to plant. And uh, we just could not get in with the weather and one thing or another, and that's when, that's when it took place, actually. And I think as it turned out, that was, uh, 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 we were kind of behind the eight ball before we knew it, or we thought we knew it anyway, but. I think later on we realized that that indeed uh, did occur. But that's a look at it uh, down a roar on the clay on July the 1st, that's the second irrigation. And we had the beans going, I think, very well. They looked great, in fact. That's the UA 4910 uh, that uh, Dr. Chen just released here. 
Well, it's about uh, 60 days after planting. That's what it looked like at, at Mariana on the Cotton Branch. That's a group of farmers from Turkey on a United Soybean Board tour. And uh, look, and I felt pretty good about what we're twin rows on 38 inch beds. And looks like we're about to lap good. And uh, I was feeling pretty good about the crop. I guess I was probably doing a little bragging there, but uh, uh, I was in for a shock. I'll just say that. 119 days from planting, we're ready to harvest. Robert Goodson came over and helped uh, Mr. Kennedy. We had the way wagon there, blocked it all off. And, uh, you know, everything, I thought the variety, everything looked pretty good. Expecting uh, 70 bushels up and uh, didn't quite get that. And that's a look at Roar about the same time on September the 30th. Uh, I planted there about the 13th of May. And again, the crop looked great on that, on that clay. Well, there's the yields, and uh, what an education. I've been around this, uh, you've been trying to educate me for years here in Arkansas, but uh, it looks like uh, I still need to go back to school. Uh, uh, in some cases, we got no yield uh, bump at all from the intensive uh, management, but I really didn't see much yield difference there. Uh, you know, these are not replicated studies, so you're gonna get some variation, so uh, that, that's just what happened. and. Uh, it happened at all three locations. They all look beautiful. And uh, I've, uh, 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 he, he's in the room that shared this comment with me, but I, I just felt like it was appropriate. A Lone Oak County farmer, is, I'm uh, paraphrasing, I guess, uh, made the quote something to the fact that he had, when he just finished harvesting his crop, he said, I just got through harvesting the prettiest, sorriest bean crop I've ever had, I think. So, and so uh, did I do that about halfway right, Davis? I don't know, okay. So uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of what we did. We had a beautiful looking crop, but when you got out in there and really looked, we didn't have the pod set that we needed to get the kind of yields for the inputs that we put in. So uh, there's some other people gonna talk about stresses, Dr. Purcell and, and uh, Jeremy's gonna be talking about some of the things that happened. And Dr. Kelly, Jason Kelly, our, our feed grain specialist here in Arkansas sent me this. He said, Lanny, this might be part of the answer but if you look at nighttime temperatures with the red line, 30 year average, and where we were starting about the middle of May, we're up above that line and we really never come on, uh, out of it for about three months. So these elevated nighttime temperatures, we got a physiologist in the room, maybe can share with us what that's maybe partially responsible for the, the delayed planting date with the maturity and put it all together. And, well, you saw what we got. So uh, in, in conclusion on this first year, and this is just the first year of this, uh, no yield advantage to, uh, to the extra inputs that we put in there. Of course, we had considerable more expense, uh, but, uh, and, and we were not rewarded for it. And uh, I would say that uh, if you've doubted your extension, the research-based extension recommendations, they held up pretty good. Uh, year in and year out, uh, they're pretty solid. We, we know there's opportunities to increase yields, but under the conditions that we did this year, that we conducted uh, th this little study, uh, we were not able to capitalize on that. So our pretty good valid uh, recommendations that's been developed over time. And uh, as I mentioned, we did see opportunities for increased yields. There's no question about it. We grew a, a, a we had more height, more biomass, in some cases even more nodes, but we were not able to, with the environmental conditions, take advantage of it. And some things to look at, a lot of research uh, needed, and uh, this database that Todd referred to uh, is gonna be very helpful with some of the growers are doing, and, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But I wanna thank everybody, the, uh, the, the ARC, you farmers in this room for supporting uh, research like this or demonstration like this, promotion board and all the faculty, specialists that's that involved in Division of Agriculture. They, they did everything they could to make this thing successful and will continue to do so. And uh, getting back to that yield challenge, we hadn't broken that 100 bushel per acre. Of course, we didn't even get close in our, my little project today or this year, but this Grove for the Green contest and uh, uh, that, that the Soybean Association is, is, is kind of administering some of you, about 50. I know some of you in this room participated in that. 
I looked at the top five winners uh, in the early season. They planted in April. We had the top five went over 90 bushels per acre. So from 90 to 94 bushels per acre, five people, and the latest planting date, first, April, the earliest planting date, I believe, was April the 1st. The latest of these top five was April the 9th. And uh, all of them, I believe, were indeterminate fours, wherever they were at. They had the opportunity to get in there early, and uh, that's, that's kind of a common denominator. Their row widths vary, and seating rates vary, and stuff like that, but pretty much uh, uh, an eye-opener, and that's the way that's kind of held up for the last few years. But the yields, they were able to get up there pretty close to that 100 mark. And uh, if you're not participating in that contest, uh, I'm making the assumption that it'll be supported again by the board, but uh, this year at least, that was the way it broke out. Top four places, 10,000, 7,500, 500, 5,000, 2,500, I believe were the breakouts on it. So uh, hope you leave next year, uh, you'll, if you got a good looking field and want to go for it, that uh, they are certainly trying to build this database. We do ask for a lot of information in it. And I'm gonna wind this up. I know we're, I'm going to probably a little long again, living up to this reputation I developed. But uh, edamame, vegetable soybeans, it's a reality in Arkansas. Uh, uh, should be doing groundbreaking uh, just very soon over in Western Arkansas. And this is a, this program has some breeding work by Dr. Chen, our so U of A uh, public soybean breeder. And uh, they're using one of his varieties as uh, one of the two varieties for 2012. So uh, that, that is getting initiated and been supported uh, by your checkoff dollars, uh, at least to some extent. And they're looking at other markets with additional products. So, and then finally, I wanted to mention the Mid-South Soybean Board, Arkansas uh, Soybean Promotion Board, joined with Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Uh, to form this Mid-South Soybean Board. They're funding some regional projects, and uh, USB is, a, is also a strong contributor to this, this program. And uh, Dr. Larry Purcell has agreed to be the principal investigator. This is our first funded research project, as you can see up on the screen. Uh, very aggressive, uh, very large in scale, and uh, involving a lot of cooperators. Actually, in six states, we're gonna have a location in Boot Hill in Missouri and over in uh, Northwest Tennessee. Uh, that's your board members that uh, support all this work, oversee it. And uh, some of them are also representing you on the USB. Of course, you met uh, Todd Allen. And I know they're gonna shoot me for this, but the, these are kind of my bosses here. And I'd like for them to stand so you know who they are if you got some comments or questions. But the board members that are here stand up. I know, uh, Jim Carroll had to run into a medical appointment in Little Rock. So they're scattered out over the room, look around and uh, visit with them about uh, if you have any concerns about it, I appreciate that. And if I can be of assistance as a research coordinator for the board, uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Appreciate it very much. Your Arkansas Soybean Podcast is a production of the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture and was funded in part by the Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board. For more information on soybean farming in Arkansas, contact your local county extension office.